Super. So welcome, everybody. Um, today, we have our webinar on learning through audio-supported reading, um, myth or reality. My name is Lynn McCormack, and I am the senior technologist on the AIM Center. I'm also a software engineer here at TAP. Um, we have a few people with us. Um, we have uh, Leslie O'Callaghan, who will be working on our chat window today. She'll be giving you lots of information and tips, uh, links for you to be able to follow. She'll also be checking for questions that she can answer or that I can answer or that our presenter can answer. Um, if you've noticed, we have our captioning going on, and we're going to shout out early on here to Annette Flo, who is working our um, captioning for today. So thank you so much for joining us, Annette. And um, just a few things before we get started. Um, one, if you've got any questions, uh, please do enter them in the chat window. It's on the lower right-hand side. Um, if you haven't introduced yourself, please do introduce yourself in that chat window right now. So I would just see your name, where you're from, and maybe a little bit of something about what you're hoping to get us today. Uh, the webinar slides and digital handout are available for download. That link um, has been entered in the chat window if you weren't able to do that before. So please uh, feel free to download those and follow along as well. The archive and the transcript for today's webinar will be available within a week on the same location um, where the handouts are available. And as we finish up today, um, you will be given our evaluation link. And it's really important to us to be able to get your feedback. And um, so if you could just take a few moments at the end of the presentation to uh, fill that out and get that back to us, it'll be automatically displayed um, as we exit the uh, webinar. I'll remind you of that as well. Um, so a little bit about the AIM Center. Um, the AIM Center goals are to help build the capacity of states and districts, uh, post-secondary institutions, families, publishers, and workforce development agencies, agencies, as well as other stakeholders to increase the availability and use the high quality accessible materials and technology, or AIM, to support improved learning <laughs> opportunities and outcomes for learners with disabilities. And if you haven't been to the AIM Center site, on the right hand side is an, uh, an image of the home page that you would find uh, when you went to the AIM Center. So please do visit our website. Um, the AIM Center provides technical assistance, tools, resources, and, and really that, that are all built on the best practices. Um, and they're all available to multiple stakeholders. And on the right-hand side here, you see an image of the learners that we support, um, the, the early learning, uh, K-12, higher ed, workforce development, as well as um, state resources that you'll be able to find there. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're so fortunate to have <laughs> Richard Jackson here to talk about audio-supported reading. And um, I'm going to let him introduce himself to you. Hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here today with you. I'm going to begin by uh, telling you a little bit about myself and uh, my own experiences with audio-supported reading. Let me say first off that uh, I've been affiliated with CAP since 1999 as a senior research scientist. But I've also been uh, a professor at Boston College for longer than that, uh, dating back uh, through the 80s. Uh, my, most of my work uh, throughout my career has been in teacher education, uh, particularly low incident disabilities and uh, students who are blind and visually impaired. Uh, also, a lot of my work has been uh, uh, focusing on uh, technology and functional uses of, of vision. Uh, I am uh, myself uh, legally blind. I have four 200s vision. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, 24, 2400s vision in my better eye, uh, which means that uh, what you might see at 400s feet I can see at 20 feet away. As I say that, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but I have very little vision. I guess I, I can count fingers at about eight feet. That might, might help. Uh, so uh, throughout my life, I've had a lot of fluctuation in my 
my vision, so I've had to adjust my uh, reading supports uh, throughout that time. Uh, I've, I also have a, uh, a hearing impairment uh, that's, that's quite severe. It's attenuated somewhat with uh, the super-duper hearing aids these days. I, I mentioned the hearing impairment because uh, the presentation today has a lot to do with audio supports for reading, and uh, I continue uh, to be able to benefit from audio supports. So I, I'd like to say a little bit about my own experience with literacy uh, growing up uh, and going through college, and a lot of the uh, experiences that you may have observed in your students or people that you work with or um, as the years have gone by uh, down to the present time. Um, let me just say at the beginning that uh, I, I believe there's, there's, there's never been a better time in history to be a legally blind person uh, with the availability of digital content today and the availability of, of technology tools that can access and work with that content. That's, that's my experience. Here and now, I, I wish I had another 30 years in my career. I can't imagine what uh, lies ahead, but I think it's uh, a lot, a lot of more, a lot more good news. So early on, uh, I was in uh, a special class throughout elementary school, and I learned to read using large print. Uh, there really were very few uh, print resources available to us in those days. So we were often read to and given uh, IRES requirements by our teachers. So literacy was not a, a major, um, a major um, focus of our early education. Then in middle school and high school, uh, there was little availability of large print, and we relied on um, volunteer readers and parents, of course, to do the reading. And through college, early on, there were supports from what was then called um, Recordings for the Blind, now known as uh, Learning Ally. Um, there was also some support from the National Library Services, particularly uh, literary works. Now, these worlds were completely dividing the print world from the auditory world or the learning through listening world. Uh, there was no uh, way to blend these resources uh, back back in those days. It really wasn't until uh, very late in the 90s and, and even the early 2000s until um, technology, technology has evolved uh, to the point where we can now blend either uh, magnified print or uh, braille, refreshable braille, uh, with uh, text-to-speech for auditory information. Uh, there's a great deal of wide interest in auditory uh, listening uh, technologies today. Uh, certainly the, uh, the common core standards are stressing uh, listening. Uh, we are in a multimedia age. We are very much consuming a lot of um, information through multimedia and being able to comprehend information through listening along with other uh, media uh, is a very important asset for, for students and everybody else learning um, going forward. In, a, in addition to that, um, the, um, the tools available today uh, really allow us to uh, interact with uh, what, what we're listening. So let me say, uh, let me go on and get into the into the meat of this presentation and talk to you about uh, outcomes. What do we? What I hope uh, you'll walk away with uh, today. What you'll take with you. And uh, I'd, I'd like to begin with um, helping you appreciate uh, the step to becoming a proficient reader. Uh, you all are have heard of uh, the reading wars uh, that raged through the 90s. In early part, in early uh, part of the uh, 21st century, reading wars referred to: should we be teaching reading skills, or should we be providing students with a very rich literacy environment uh, that would uh, not bore them or frustrate them 
with a focus on skills, not turn them off to literacy, but rather include things like listening and storytelling and uh, very rich literacy environments. Uh, this, these reading wars have been settled. Uh, for, the result is now most people embrace a, a balanced approach to literacy, where we are in a, uh, a literacy-rich literacy uh, classroom experience, but we're also focusing on skills. Uh, the National Reading Panel report from 2000, published by the National Research uh, Council, um, identified a series of skills that are absolutely required uh, for students to become uh, proficient reading readers. So I'd, I'd like to spend a little time uh, looking at those skills because I think they'll get us to the next outcome, help us understand the barriers that confront uh, readers with print disabilities. Now, by print disabilities, I mean students who have a, because of a physical disability, or because uh, they are struggling, they struggle with reading, or they have a sensory impairment, and there's a physical, medical, or neurological basis for their uh, reading uh, difficulty. I'm sorry, Richard, I'm going to interrupt you just for yeah. a moment. If you are on the phone line, if you could mute your phone line, because I'm hearing quite a lot of noise coming from the phone. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, Richard, please. Continue. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, so uh, after looking at the, the barriers with reference to the rating panel skills, uh, I'd also uh, like to get into uh, the solutions, how these barriers can be passed through, circumvented uh, with the use of audio supported reading. So let me just say at the outset, when I say audio supported reading, I'm talking about the options that are available to a user for mixing text to speech with uh, the print, either magnified print on screen or an enhanced uh, presentation of the print or a, a refreshable braille uh, representation of the print. So building audio supports on top of that to blend the information uh, coming into the, the user. And we'll, we'll be able to elaborate a bit more on that when I talk about how audio supported reading can address the, the various barriers. Also like you to uh, take away um, what are the what are the tools out there? Um, for example, I was very limited in uh, what I could read, where I could read, how long I could tolerate reading and interacting with text. But today, uh, I use technologies, every, I use uh, audio supported reading anywhere and everywhere. I use desktop computers, large screen monitors, I use tablets, I use uh, um, phones, and um, uh, a whole range of things to allow me to read in transit, uh, read in class when I'm teaching, and read uh, at home or, or in the office where I have a range of equipment at my disposal. I, I have to do a lot of reading these days. Uh, I guess I've always had to do a lot of reading, but at this, at this point I'm really able to independently uh, read dissertations and journal articles and uh, books, uh, all kinds of keep up with uh, news. All of this is uh, available to me and many other people like me uh, who uh, can use these conventionally available technologies and uh, digital resources. So having said all of that, I'd like, I, I, I hope that people will leave here uh, with an appreciation that um, listening can to books and other uh, uh, instructional materials can really be an asset, a benefit uh, uh, to learning, uh, particularly when uh, we can uh, blend these modalities. So um, I'm sure everybody's heard about learning to read so that we can read to learn. And this kind of cuts across the curriculum. Early on in elementary school, there's a skills focus on 
explicit instruction. Uh, later on, there's a, a focus on uh, implicit instruction where students are given projects and presumably they have the skills and resources uh, to carry out those projects. So we learn to read, we also learn to calculate, and then we learn to write. All of this is we're learning to read so we can read to learn, learning to calculate so that we can calculate to solve problems, and we're learning to, uh, we're writing to uh, create products that are uh, consumable, marketable, uh, that sort of ensure our future in the world of work. So looking at uh, breaking down this learning to read, either print or braille, uh, getting into w what was suggested by the learning panel, we see un to understand uh, the connection between speech sounds, phonology, and the printed text, orthography. Those are two big words, uh, phonology and orthography. Well, phonology would be the system of rules that are used uh, in one's native language to generate speech sounds. And orthography would be a system of symbols that would correspond to those uh, phonological uh, or phonemic uh, units. Now, that learning to uh, speak uh, as, as the result of being in a very rich uh, perceptual um, propitious environment in the company of, of good linguistic models. And speech is quite a natural outgrowth of, of development. But learning to recognize the orthography of one's native language, the written language, is, a, is a, for many, many people a very complicated task. And I'll, I'll say a little bit, when I get into the barriers on that, I'll say why that can be a complicated task. Uh, uh, the use of, uh, the use of this understanding to, to attack, that is, sound out uh, unfamiliar words, is another skill. So you're taking this sort of knowledge of how uh, sounds correspond with the graphic representation of the sound. Um, once you understand that, then you can use these units of sound to support word recognition by auditorializing or sounding out words. Rapidly naming frequent or familiar words, you know, the ability to see words as chunks uh, over time with a lot of repetition to be able to rapidly name these words. Rapidly, um, to, ex to expand our vocabulary, uh, to, uh, to be able to uh, expand our lexicon, our, our, our foundation for background knowledge. Uh, to recognize vocabulary words. That's another important uh, uh, skill. The ability to read uh, fluently uh, connected text with prosody. Prosody is a, a nice word. Prosody refers to intonation, tone, stress, rhythm. You know, a behaviorist might define reading as a behavior. That is, that would, uh, reading would be the ability to stand up prompted by a teacher uh, in front of the class uh, to read uh, fluently with expression, intonation, uh, hesitation, all these appropriate um, uh, uh, contours of the speech utterance in response to what's being decoded on the page. That sort of defines reading behavior. And you know, there's some value in that because if a person can do that, it indicates that they're comprehending, uh, but not always. So to be able to read fluently with prosody suggests that you, you're understanding what you're reading. There's a thing like the, called the eye voice span, where your eye is ahead of your voice, and you have to process the information to be able to uh, insert, uh, include uh, prosodic um, uh, expression, but not uh, this becomes a if, if one cannot read fluently, then there's then there's a disruption to this. But not all uh, fluent readers 
uh, are comprehending what they're uh, what they're uh, presenting. The, uh, the ability to acquire, acquire strategies for making meaning out of text. Ultimately, that's, that's where we're going. We're, we're, we really want uh, to uh, be exposed independently, manipulate the information, access the information, but more important, importantly, make sense out of it, be able to draw inferences from the information, to be able to uh, ask questions of the information, clarify the information, the ability to uh, retell or summarize the information. All these would be indicators of one's ability to make meaning out of what they gather uh, from written text. And finally, very important to, uh, to develop the, the motivation uh, to persist in a reading task. Now, I'm going to turn now to look at, if these are like the important features from the reading panel, let's look at um, the challenges. So speech, in the, speech is the oral expression of language. And I said earlier that speech is pretty, pretty automatic if um, you're, as, you de, as you develop, as language emerges uh, in the human, uh, speech is a sort of direct expression or readout of that language. Uh, but um, the ability to read is something in, entirely different. So if you, if you have this match between, uh, if, if you are able to um, match up the orthography of your spoken language with the phonemic uh, sounds within your language, uh, this is a natural, uh, naturally occurring thing in most uh, young children at about age three. But for many children, this natural connection does not emerge. And that's why there's so much stress on early skills and phonics uh, to get kids to become very fluent, efficient readers early on uh, as reading demands increase going through, through the grades. Uh, another uh, challenge is, is the world of print size. And you know, for I learned to read with 24 and 18 point uh, prints in elementary school, and there was a paucity of these resources uh, thereafter. Um, by eighth grade, I was using high powered uh, plus lenses to read standard print. That introduced uh, other challenges. There have been debates over the years about uh, the use of uh, uh, about what would be the preferred print size. Well, today those problems are kind of eradicated because, you know, with the pinching motions on tablets and touch screens, uh, we can pretty much uh, zoom in on a, on a preferred print size. The print size doesn't just apply to students with uh, vision impairment. Uh, print size also applies to struggling readers. Uh, we know that uh, students who struggle with reading do better on standardized tests with, with uh, large print than they do with standard print. We know that many uh, uh, students with reading difficulties will exhibit a preference uh, for larger print. So the best solution for print size is to experiment with uh, prints like dyslexia and uh, specialized uh, fonts different colors, it's fine to experiment with that, but also to be able to select uh, a print size and style that uh, provides the most comfort. And there may even be a novelty feature in there that they may want to change their, their preferences. They should be really free, free to do that. Uh, insufficient background knowledge, limited surface language facility, and paucity of shared reading experiences. So this is, this is really, uh, another whole set of barriers with people coming to the learning process, coming into school with very limited Braille users, for example, with very limited exposure to the orthography or uh, kids that are beginning as disfluent readers and not really uh, getting into um, uh, getting into the text uh, won't have the opportunity uh, to expand their background knowledge and bring that uh, knowledge to uh, 
to their, and if they're learning English, that's, that's what's meant by limited surface uh, language facility. This would be uh, kids coming from, uh, that are learning English uh, for the first time, and they're in school, and they're having to um, learn surface characteristics. It could also be um, learning a new author orthography, learning a, a whole new vocabulary, a whole new uh, surface syntactic structure. All of this can uh, challenge uh, the development of reading. What I'm calling here a, a hyper-focus on the rules for phonic and linguistic analysis. And what I'm, what I'm referring to here is uh, what can slow down uh, reading fluency is difficulty with decoding. And if one is um, learning the units of sound, focusing uh, on decoding the units of sound, or decoding the, um, the uh, morphological structures of the words, like frequently occurring A-T-I-O-N or prefixes and suffixes that bring meaning to the word, but a, a hyper-focus on these word analysis skills uh, can slow down the reading of, while, while, these, while these are constructive uh, and uh, can help you down the line rapidly name words, uh, a hyper-focus uh, by, the, by the reader is slowing uh, the process in loading uh, working memory. Uh, phys just the physical demands. Uh, you know, there's a very, uh, this is in the resources, but Ann Korn and her, uh, when she was at Vanderbilt and her colleagues uh, did some extensive studies of early readers with low vision. And she has a, 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 a a graph des describing uh, the development of words read correctly per minute among low vision readers in comparison with readers, with typ typically developing readers. And the slope of these graphs are really showing that low vision readers are progressing uh, with the same slope up to, a up to grade five, and then at grade five, their words read correctly per minute uh, plateau across all the way up to 12th grade. And you know, this is suggesting to me that low vision readers can acquire the skills early on uh, at uh, the same slope. They're, they're reading slower at the beginning, but their reading progress is arrested at the fifth grade. So this this tells me that it's too much work to just focus on the vision reading, whether they're using magnification or they're using large print uh, content. Is the reading load is very demanding uh, in upper elementary through middle school, and the, the challenge of holding the books up and holding your your optical aids or your face, managing lights, all the, just the physical. Uh, experience of reading, uh, one would have to be enormously motivated to, 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 to overcome. And I'm saying nothing here about students with physical difficulties uh, or students that are just uh, focusing so much, exhausting their attention on uh, decoding, on the analysis skills and the phonological skills to attack the words. Uh, that, that they can engage in, in sustained reading. That gives us a, a sense of the, of the, the barriers. So how, how then could audio-supported reading address uh, these barriers? So when I talk about audio-supported reading, I'm, I'm pairing um, the, the text presentation with the audio presentation. Text presentation can be on screen. Uh, the text presentation can be magnified. It can have uh, uh, alternate background and foreground. Uh, the text uh, presentation can be uh, moving within a window 
for the text presentation can be, uh, I'm sorry, stationary uh, within a window, moving within a small window so one doesn't have to shift their gaze. Or the text presentation can uh, be across the screen so the user may need to use eye and head movements to pursue uh, the text presentation. And then uh, pairing this on top with, uh, with uh, text-to-speech. Text now, simultaneous pairing would be accomplished through uh, synchronized highlighting. And it would, be, it would be really important if the user can control the rate on the fly. What one of the tools I use is uh, uh, JAWS uh, along with uh, Magic. And uh, other times I use uh, Zoom text uh, with speech. I guess you, get, you might get the idea out there that I'm, 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 I'm fortunate to have access to a lot of technology, but that's, that's my career, uh, figuring out how these tools can enhance uh, students' uh, progress in school and preparing teachers to uh, help uh, general educators and uh, parents and students uh, select tools that would match up with their preferences and capabilities. So not all uh, of the tools allow for, uh, for, for changing the rate of speech uh, on the fly. Some are preset by the uh, operating system, the narrator in Windows, for example. You would set the rate ahead of time. Other tools, uh, uh, they have a more fluid integration of speech adjustments, uh, but not quite on the fly. So it would depend on uh, the, the user's need and preference as to, as to uh, how important it would be within a document uh, to synchronize, uh, to, to vary the uh, rate of the message. So what is, why, is rate, why is rate so important? So I've identified these barriers earlier, and I'm saying that if you're focusing, if, if you are dyslexic or you're a struggling reader, if you have decoding problems, if you have, uh, if you struggle at the word level, meaning you can't rapidly name, identify a word, or you can't sound out a word, uh, then the work that you would devote to this would really uh, slow your reading. And if your reading is uh, slowed, it's difficult to process the intended message within a sentence. So you might read, you might focus on the initial portion of the sentence. By the time you decode the end of the sentence or paragraph, then on the subject, you'll miss the, uh, the, the predicate or you'll have a miscue, you won't. So if, if you can pick up some of the information visually, but get the substance of the message uh, auditorially, then uh, your reading uh, rate overall will, will increase. This is not an easy, easy thing to understand. I'll come back to the I-voice span. Um, this, is, this actually happens to me. I'll be reading uh, on screen, and I'll be listening as I'm reading. And I'm, I might hear, uh, I might hear something that doesn't make sense. So within that span, I can kind of stop and look back and self-correct with reference to the vision. And the same goes goes in the other direction. If I'm looking uh, at a word and uh, I miss there's a miscue, I, I mispronounce it, uh, then I can pay attention to the text speech's pronunciation. So there's this, there's this distance between, this time lapse between where I'm looking and, and what I'm listening to. And within that buffer, um, within that buffer, I can, I can move around and select. Now, 
don't want you to get the impression that you're, you're simultaneously processing vision and auditory information. What you're, what you're really doing is when the material is very familiar, you're paying attention to the auditory portion. When the material is uh, very difficult, if you're doing close reading, where you're going for what we call deep learning now, and you really have to interrogate the text, well, that's where you're working and thinking on a much smaller uh, unit of information. And that's where you'll need to focus on your refreshable braille or your, your, your print. And when, when you're getting into London um, information or familiar material, uh, that's where you can uh, really uh, take off. Or you're having to review or even preview information, the auditory uh, uh, focus can be um, allow you to really build uh, build reading speed. In my case, uh, I read at 150 words per minute when I'm using screen magnification. That's little. That that's that's almost half of what a high school senior would read. When I put the speech on top of what I'm reading on screen, I can reach. Love, uh, 400 words per minute. Now that would be, I can process that and hear it decoded auditorily, uh, but, it, but it would be very familiar, sort of easy stuff to read at that rate. So compare this with a, with a Braille reader. Um, the average Braille reader is 115 words per minute. So that, that's kind of close to one third one half to one third the rate of a typically um, graduating high school senior. So it's, it's, Braille is still absolutely essential to, con to have connection with the orthography of English language. You can't, you can't have contact with the structure of words for spelling and composition and for working within the syntax of a sentence in text uh, without reference to Braille. But uh, Braille is not replaceable. But Braille can be supported and enhanced with speech. Um, and I think, that's, um, I think that's a major takeaway. So in my, in my struggle to read at 150 words per minute, the frustrations at that slow rate, the difficulty with head movements, eye movements, magnification, light management, all of these things, are, are all uh, removed, um, all mitigated um, with auditory support. I think these. I think I. Uh, I think I've really addressed all of these uh, benefits uh, to audio. So so long as people are getting um, a sense of what the experience would be like of reading a page of text with synchronized highlighting and focusing on the words as they are pronounced and also being able to look and listen or feel on the Braille and listen at the same time. So this, this is a, um, a, a fellow from uh, Alabama School for the Blind and Bookshare has uh, created a video uh, in their in their uh, YouTube channel of of this young man, a very impressive young man. He is talking about his reading interests, and uh, this is in the resource uh, list as well. He's talking about his his reading interests, uh, and he's showing how he downloads and uh, stores his reading material. And then he demonstrates how he um, reads the text uh, on his refreshable Braille display and listens at the same time. And he actually mentions how uh, with listening, he can go much faster. But of course, he needs the Braille to look for how words are spelled or really appreciate the structure uh, because he has that or, or access to the Braille orthography, he, he has a, a, a physical contact with, uh, with the world of text. But it's the 
supported by auditory. These next couple of slides are just showing you examples uh, of, of, of uh, refreshable Braille uh, technologies that also have uh, speech support. And then there's a couple of screens here uh, from uh, AI Squared, Squared's uh, Zoom Tech. Um, I think early, my, my early on most efficient use of uh, audio supported reading came with uh, Zoom text. Uh, the screen to the, the image, uh, come back, the image to the, the image to the right uh, is, uh, I think, a doc reader uh, where the uh, word being spoken is highlighted and it's on a reverse display. So you really have high contrast here and focus is drawn to uh, the word being read out loud. And then to the left, it's the app reader. And the app reader is the actual uh, YZWIG uh, text page uh, that you're working with. And it's, um, it's how it would look to anybody on a screen, uh, screen on a screen for print. And uh, you can see that uh, the words that they're being read aloud are highlighted. And then again, this wonderful navigation capability of moving around the screen with, uh, with these resources. And the, uh, the, next, uh, the next slide is uh, yours truly. And this is uh, a video that we made at the AIM Center in 2012. And it shows me uh, reading with Zoom text and with, um, with an iPad tablet. So I'm using Zoom text on my, on my uh, laptop uh, with a large screen attachment. And I'm using um, voice aloud on my Android tablet. And I'm using uh, uh, voice dream reader with, uh, with my iPad. So these are uh, so three uh, applications um, that really allow for the synchronized highlighting, high quality speech, and the adjustments uh, on the screen that are really worthy of note. So in the next slide, um, there's just, just, just uh, refers to three uh, sources that I use, and I think everybody uh, uh, uses um, Bookshare and Learning Ally and the BARD program. So the BARD program can provide you with, uh, with uh, Braille documents uh, for audio supported reading on Braille, um, refreshable Braille machines. The, um, the same would be true for, uh, for Bookshare resources. And the Learning Ally uh, has an, uh, some audio supported uh, text working with uh, their file, file format system and then um, matching it, aligning it with uh, human speech. So these are, um, in the PowerPoint, these are all uh, linked, we'll all link out to these uh, sources. So here we're seeing something that I, I, I don't know anybody that's worked with this, but it's, it's absolutely fantastic. If you, if you use the Chrome browser and you use um, Bookshare's uh, web reader, you can open up um, a book from Bookshare and set the screen to a, how, however you like it, and then have synchronized highlighting the screen read to you. But you can also resize the screen and then open up uh, another doc for note taking. You could, you could open up Google Keep or you could open up a Word doc or you could open up a um, Google doc. And this is quite amazing. Uh, you're working with a primary text document in the web reader on the left and anything, if you want to take a note, you just drag it over uh, 
uh, to the right side. So think about the difficulty that kids have had in the past of taking notes while they're reading. If they're holding a book up to a high plus lens or if they're bent over a desk reading um, uh, from large print and they have to take a note or they want to uh, use, take content from what they're reading and move it to another place, how, how challenging that would be. But this facility would... <coughs> so Bruce is, what, Bruce is asking whether they're still using this extension at this point. So I'm not I don't think the extension is, is needed. I think if you're in... If you're in um, I've, I've done it recently with my extension turned on and off. I had the same, I've had the same question. <laughs> I think they've said that uh, you no longer need the extension. But I've, I've been primarily working in uh, Chrome. Uh, it may work a little differently in, in, uh, in Firefox. But it's, uh, you know, with the proliferation of Google Classroom uh, or, or Google Suite um, and the Chrome browser and being able to access Bookshare resources through Chrome, um, I think the, the workflow in the, in the classroom environment is just open to some fabulous, fabulous opportunities. I, I think we need to be open for some great um, uh, great um, pedagogical developments. You know, we've always been concerned about taking information in, accessing the information. I think now we have opportunities to interact with the information and create our own products as a result of that access and really demonstrate what we know and can do. And then the, the final uh, slide here in my presentation is, is uh, just showing that the synchronized highlighting works um, in the Bookshare uh, web reader. And as, you know, as long as you have access to the web and you have you are a member of Bookshare or you, or you through your school program, you access Bookshare materials, and you know this this becomes a free resource that's um, incredibly powerful. So so there are um, there's a there's a range of exciting things going on now. I uh, just mentioned uh, text text help and so Richard, one of our um, our colleagues here on um, was mentioning that they've had success with um, text help as well. Oh. Um, so, that's a, yeah. so Shannon, thank you for that comment. Yeah. I, I myself am a huge fan of TextHelp. Um, we here at CAST um, have their toolbar on many of our websites, including the AIM website yeah. as well as the CAST website. But um, I also take classes and um, when I'm tired, it, for, for me, I don't, I don't have a, a, a print disability, but it just speeds up my ability to read and to comprehend, Absolutely. and um, it works so seamlessly with the Google Docs. And so, um, Richard, I don't think and, on, and, on, and on your and on your tablet, you could actually listen to these on your way to and from while you're in commuting. Yeah. I wouldn't suggest that you hold it up in front of the steering wheel and try to do audio before <laughs> reading. But so the, the, the don't do that at home, kids. Right. <laughs> We're not advocating for driving and having audio supported reading. The, the text help really is a, it's a fabulous at uh, at Boston College. Uh, we just uh, obtained a license uh, for the full uh, package of text help resources. That's the Google uh, text help for Google that builds in the, the bar and all these learning resources to Google, but also the desktop version of um, and the tablet and laptop and, and uh, phone versions of text help. Now, any student or faculty member or staff member with a BC email address will have access to these tools. So we're very excited about bringing accessibility into our teacher preparation program, not just special educators, but uh, you know, as, as more and more of these learning management systems come into our into our K-12 classroom, uh, being able to have available all of these uh, uh, supports and assists uh, through uh, text help and, uh, and others. Others are coming along too, Don Johnson and 
um, and, and Kurzweil 3000. So it's not a it's not a text help ad, but uh, it's 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 just very exciting. Um, I I'll just go right back to where I began with this. It's a very very different world than being a, uh, a legally blind student in a special class back years ago, uh, and you know putting. Uh, 50 cent pieces on tone arms to keep a uh, sound scriber sheet from skipping around while listening to college textbooks. So it's a, it's a, a wonderful, um, wonderful opportunity out there. So we just got a question in from Ryan, and he's asking, is there any evidence other than anecdotal evidence that audio supported reading improves comprehension in all readers, or does it depend on the type of reader? That's a great question. There's a, there's a just published a meta-analysis. Uh, it's in your resources. It's by uh, Wood and colleagues from the uh, from University of Florida. Um, there was a meta-analysis about uh, reading comprehension enhancements uh, for uh, text-to-speech testing. Now, now there's support for its uh, improvement of comprehension and general uh, reading applications. So if you look if you look at these resources, you'll see the uh, the evidence from the meta analysis. Uh, I I kind of there's a difference between remedial uses of text to speech and facilitative or or uh, or um, compensatory uses. And I'm I'm really talking about uh, facilitative compensatory. It's, uh, to me, it's like if, uh, there's no way I could stop using these audio supports. It would be like uh, a person in a wheelchair no longer having access to a wheelchair or jumping out of a plane without a parachute. It's, a, it's obvious uh, that um, my, my speed and comfort uh, in use of text has, and that, that gets to me as one individual, but the meta-analysis is really addressing a uh, whole theory studies that were screened and the results, the, the, um, the effects of these studies are combined and summarized in the Wood article. That's a great question. Um, so are there any other questions at this point in time? We only just have a few minutes left at this point. Um, I'm going to post. Um, so we have a, only a few minutes left and if you, I'm going to Bring over the. I'm going to post the link. Or Leslie, can you post the link to the um, survey in the chat window if folks want to um, do that before we actually finish up? Um, one of the things I want to mention is just to say thank you to all of you that posted great comments and um, ideas or shared your experiences in the chat window. That really makes for a much uh, richer experience for everybody. Oh. Thanks, Leslie. Leslie did not get that. I'm going to grab the um, link and post that in the window. Um, so if you want to take a look um, in the chat window, I've posted the link to the survey for today. We're so thankful that you were able to join us today, and we're so thankful to Richard Jackson for sharing his wealth of knowledge in this area. This has been really enlightening, and I really appreciate all of your time and efforts to prepare for today. I want to thank Leslie as well for her help in the chat window. Thank you so much, Leslie. And if you have any um, questions or need any follow-up, Leslie is always here to help, help out with those sort of things. And I want to give a huge shout out to our um, captioner, Annette. Thank you so much. I know that um, folks actually mentioned in the chat window how your support in providing the captions today really provided full access to today's webinar. So thank you so much for your support and I hope that everybody has a great day and um, please do fill out our survey. We're, we're, um, that will come up in just a moment as I end this meeting. And Leslie will stop the recording in one minute after Richard says thank you. Yes, and I want to thank Lynn, uh, Lynn McCormick for, uh, for hosting today's meeting and uh, holding my hand through this whole operation uh, and really enjoyed uh, had some great uh, comments and questions, and I hope you find it helpful, and I hope you'll uh, visit the AIM uh, site and look at the resources. A couple of papers on audio-supported reading that get into the information processing benefits and um, 
you know, how, how this works out with the, uh, uh, with, uh, with cognitive load and working memory. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you.